Hey everyone, welcome back to the REST API in-depth series. In this video, we're gonna go over network protocols together. Um, this is something I really wanted to include in this course, and I wanted to separate it out from what we looked at previously together in the previous video, which are things like the uh, DNS system, uh, IP addresses, and ports. Uh, network protocols are, are one of those kind of ethereal things that you're gonna see thrown out there all the time. Uh, in fact, you're gonna see some of this terminology or at least the acronyms you've probably seen somewhere before, but if you were to ask to explain them, uh, I think that that's where a lot of people would really struggle. Uh, it definitely is a, a, a bit separate really from uh, programming, I would say, this part of the uh, the content. Uh, but I think it's so fundamental to understanding how these systems work behind the scenes. And it really helps you debug uh, some of the APIs that you end up creating and we're going to be creating later together as well, that when you do see these words and lingo and terminology being turn, uh, thrown around, uh, it'll really help you understand uh, kind of what's happening behind the scenes. So without further ado, let's get right to the content. Okay, so to start, um, we're going to be looking at uh, these main technologies and protocols together uh, in this uh, part of the course. There are many other protocols out there, and I'll name a few as we go through. But we're going to be looking at HTTP, HTTPS, uh, TCP, UDP, and uh, IP as well. Um, now, you've probably heard of some of these, as I mentioned, and some of them you probably have not heard of. Or if you have heard of them, uh, probably just vaguely uh, flying around. Now, the way to think about this is that very similar to what we looked at previously when we looked at DNS, uh, IP addresses and ports, um, those were addresses and ways to actually get to where we need to go, get to our destination and get to our source, uh, just like you deliver mail around in the real world. Uh, protocols are the actual communication medium where those deliveries take place. So that's another crucial piece of the puzzle that we need to understand in order to understand how these networks work and how we can connect them together uh, and how they communicate with each other because that's really all REST is after all. So let's get right to uh, a little model that I think is going to help us understand at a very high level before we dive into each of these technologies specifically. So this is something called the OSI model. Um, I actually forget <laughs> what, what OSI uh, stands for. It's an acronym. Um, I, I think most people just refer to it as OSI model. There's other uh, acronyms as well, like something interconnect or system interconnect. I, I can't remember open systems. Um, the, the point is, though, that you'll probably see this stack uh, quite a lot. It, it's it's going to probably uh, pop up. And understanding this stack, when I first looked at it, um, was a bit confusing uh, because a lot of these are actually not really as like quote unquote relevant anymore. There's a lot of criticism against this model. However, uh, having this as a framework of understanding really, really does help. So um, what is this OSI model and why do we care or need to know about it when we're developing REST APIs as developers? So there's this idea of like a seven layer model, at least when we're talking about the OSI model. There's an application layer, presentation layer, session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer, and the physical layer. The idea is that from top to bottom, we're going from very abstracted and uh, kind of closer to the user. Uh, and as we go down this stack, we're going to uh, more and more specific and towards the hardware. Um, so things at the application layer that we're going to be looking and talking about, um, the application layer specifically itself are the actual applications that we are using. Like, for example, I'm using um, this drawing tool or I'm using Chrome or I'm using VS Code. Those are things that run at the application layer. Um, and there are other things in there that need protocols to communicate with each other, and we can create those strictly at this very high level. Um, now, there are protocols at these layers, uh, the these layers 7, 6, and 5, application, presentation, and session. And uh, those that are of interest to us are these ones that I have over here, specifically things like uh, HTTP and TLS, uh, which uh, we're going to be uh, looking at a little bit in this video together. Uh, DNS, we looked at previously. Uh, FTP is a file transfer protocol and IMAP is used for email. There are literally hundreds of these protocols, uh, but we're going to be focusing on HTTP. I'll show you uh, exactly what this is and why it's important to us uh, in the next uh, slide, but just keep this at the back of your mind as we're going through this for now. Um, the next thing is transport layer. This has to do, and we're going to be flipping back and forth between these as we learn each of these separately. This is like the underlying uh, mechanism with transporting uh, these, these bits of data around um, but without getting into the nitty gritty of some of the things with one layer below that, which is the network layer. So this is always kind of tricky to talk about without showing you examples, which I have uh, lined up. Um, so uh, for now, just bear with me. This is a bit confusing, but we're going to be looking at TCP and UDP together in this video. And those are uh, two of the very uh, main fundamental ideas uh, of transporting things around and packaging things in such a way uh, that we can get them transported around uh, s securely and safely. 
Um, the network layer is another one uh, that we're going to look at. We're going to look at IP. We looked at IPv4 and IPv6 in the previous uh, video together. We're going to be looking a little bit deeper into the IP um, networking protocol together at a like more fundamental level with the headers shortly. Um, and then there are these ones that are very, very low level. These are things that you may or may not have heard before. For example, things like Ethernet um, is a data lake, link layer technology, uh, wireless LAN, which is like Wi-Fi and things like that. Um, and the physical layers are things like fiber optic cables and coaxial cables and like hubs and all this kind of uh, hardware that you might use at a physical layer that's very um, like quote unquote basic and, and, and meant for one specific type of function. Um, and you can kind of swap them around depending on the actual needs that you have. Um, so you can kind of see that we kind of go from a very high level of like I have VS code, for example, uh, at all the way down to a very low level of like literally zeros and ones running through like fiber optic cables, um, like almost at the speed of light kind of thing. Right. So um, it's important to have like a mental model uh, behind the scenes of like that. This is kind of like there's all these layers of uh, abstraction that we can uh, move up and down. And we're going to see these uh, terminologies pop up quite a lot. Um, and I'll show you uh, in Insomnia and both in Chrome. Uh, shortly. And when you see them, it's important to kind of go back and, and zoom out and realize that this is kind of uh, the, the setup that they come from. So let's start with HTTP. Um, HTTP is uh, at the higher levels of that OSI model. Um, the first version, I guess technically version one was that a little bit before this, but quickly turned into HTTP 1.1, which is the one you'll see quite a lot today. Um, and that was actually in 1997, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, the way that this worked is that uh, it was a protocol that, that was kind of describing how uh, we could communicate uh, between um, kind of servers and clients uh, at a very, very high level. So the way that this worked was you, you make a request for something in a specific format, um, which we'll get to shortly, and then uh, you'll get a response for that thing. Right. So I'm, I'm going to ask for a resource and then I'm going to get that resource and I'm going to ask for another resource and I'm going to get that resource. Um, and that was it kind of just makes sense. Right. Like I'm going to ask for something and I'm going to get it. And it turns out that this works relatively well. Um, and there are some issues with this, which is going to be fixed uh, with HTTP2. And there's many more versions of that coming up as well in the future. Um, but this um, is a pretty good building block to build off of uh, because at its base, uh, we need a way to ask for stuff and then get that stuff from some remote resource. Um, so we will see actually HTTP 1.1, specifically this term, show up quite a lot. Uh, when we're using uh, different tools. Uh, so definitely keep that at the back of your mind. And this is exactly what's happening behind the scenes. We might be asking for something like index.html, for example, if it's like a website, we will get that back. And then in that HTML might be some other tags like CSS. We'll ask for that separately in a separate connection. And then uh, the script tag might be a separate connection. And each of these would be their own independent uh, TCB connection, which we'll get to later. Um, and it, it, there's a bit of inefficiencies there, which we'll, which we'll try to fix uh, with the next thing, which I'm going to show you, which is HTTP2. So um, we quickly realized that, you know, there's uh, there's probably some optimizations that we can make with with kind of this model. Right. Um, if you think about it, uh, we if we have a like a like a line open, like imagine like a like you have a phone call and you're talking to a store and the store, is, you, you call them and you say, hey, I need some I need a hammer. Right. You know, like a hardware store. And they're like, yeah, we have a hammer. We can send it to you. Uh, here you go. Um, and then later on, like five minutes later, you call back and you're like, oh yeah, hey, I, I need a screwdriver, right? And they're like, okay, sure, here, here's a screwdriver. And then like another five minutes later, you call back and you're like, I need a wrench, right? That would get kind of annoying pretty quickly. Um, uh, I guess they're they're making some business from you, so it's maybe okay, uh, but they're, you can probably think where I'm, uh, where I'm going with this. So there's a better way, right? Um, it's like, why, why do we, why bother hanging up, right? Why don't we just keep that line open and we kind of have a direct line of communication uh, with this uh, this server, this remote server, and we say, okay, like um, you know how you gave me that like index HTML thing, uh, just give me these other things as well. I'm gonna ask for a whole bunch of random stuff, and since um, we already have like a connection with each other, uh, just just like keep sending me stuff as I ask for it, um, and if I don't respond for like a really long time, then maybe you can like hang up on me, but like just kind of keep it open because I'll probably be asking you for more and more stuff over time, so I don't have to keep like hanging up, calling back, ringing you back, putting in the address, all that kind of stuff all over again for every single connection. So we can reuse a single connection for uh, a lot of data. Um, I think it's called like multiplexing and, and there's all a bunch of whole fancy terminology that's used uh, at, a, at a more fundamental level of how this all works. Uh, but that is a pretty uh, important breakthrough because this speeds up 
uh, connections greatly because now we're not making individual requests um, and we'll see there's a lot of overhead actually to each of these requests uh, when we add things like TCP for example which I'll show you next um, but uh, if we can keep that one connection alive for a bit longer, uh, we can get a bit more uh, throughput and efficiency out of it, which is pretty nice. Um, so that's HTTP2, and we'll be seeing this uh, quite a lot as well. Uh, specifically, uh, it'll show up exactly pretty much like this. Um, okay, so uh, at their core, um, this is kind of what's going on. Okay, there's there's these things called HTTP headers, and we'll get into this uh, a little bit uh, shortly. Uh, we're going to be seeing different types of headers as we work with our REST APIs, and it's important to think uh, where these come from and why they're there and why they're important. Um, all these are are a bunch of standardized information laid out in a particular way that always looks in this format, and it has specific data in it to tell us what is happening. Okay, and it always looks this way. They're, they're, these are these come through in packets, and they're always formatted in a specific size with the specific information all the time, no matter what. And if it doesn't have this, that probably means that there was an error in the communication, and we'll have to resend it. So the HTTP header specifically uh, looks something like this. There's going to be like a status line, which we'll see shortly. Uh, you'll probably see something that looks like this, like HTTP2, HTTP1.1, and then like a status code, and maybe like an OK, um, or a not found, or depending on what the status is. Then we'll have uh, a, a general header, uh, which has stuff like the date in it. We have response and request headers. For example, there might be things like a get requests or a get method. There's something called entity header, which has all the other uh, stuff in there that we're going to be looking at in quite a lot of depth and working with uh, quite extensively throughout this course together. We're actually going to be setting these manually ourselves on our servers. Uh, we can set what type of content we're sending back. Is it JSON? Is it HTML? Is it binary data from a file? Um, and there's the message body with the actual content inside. So for example, if it was uh, HTML content, the body would contain the actual like string uh, content for that actual HTML data. Okay. Um, okay, so I'd like to uh, show you uh, HTTPS really quick before I pull up Insomnia and show you a bit of these headers just so it can stick a little bit better. Uh, but since we're going to also see HTTPS as we do HTTP, I'll just show you this really quick. Um, you probably have seen this. HTTP basically, HTTPS, sorry, basically stands for HTTP over TLS. We're gonna um, not spend too much time over TLS. This is something called transport layer security. It's another uh, like protocol that um, allows us to do uh, things like this. We can secure our HTTP session. Uh, we can do uh, encryption, and we can uh, effectively what its main purpose is is to authenticate a website using these things called certificates and um, public private key encryption. So um, I don't want to get too down the rabbit hole on this, but the main thing to notice is that this is a secure version of HTTP. HTTP by default is in plain text. So every communication that we send back and forth, if we're using the HTTP protocol, uh, is in plain text, which means it's not encrypted, which means that someone listening into that network and, and reading those zeros and ones um, can actually read everything that we're sending. Uh, so we had to create HTTPS if you think about like a banking website. Uh, or you know some kind of private communication, we wouldn't want people to be able to uh, manipulate or read that data in transit. So uh, we need a way to secure that, hence this transport layer security, which provides that um, layer of security uh, over HTTPS so that we can make these communications uh, without worrying about it being intercepted or uh, manipulated. You've probably seen that happen uh, many times in your browser, for example, it appears as like a little lock icon, which I can show you shortly. Um, uh, and uh, you will normally see the URL saying specifically HTTPS instead of HTTP, uh, which shows that you're using a H, uh, an HTTP over a TLS. If it just shows HTTP, that means you're using the HTTP protocol, which is the unencrypted version of that communication network. So uh, everything that you're sending and receiving is in plain text and technically can be intercepted. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to pull up um, a couple of tools real quick. I'll pull up Insomnia. Um, and in Insomnia, we have a collection going. So I'll just pull that up. I might create more collections later. I'll have REST API collection uh, for myself here. And um, I have google.com. Okay, so I'm going to make a request to http colon slash slash uh, google.com. And I'll click send. And I'll get back google.com. We've seen this in the previous video. So this is the actual web page for google.com. I'm going to switch over to this timeline view, and I'm going to take a look uh, at what it shows here. So hopefully you can read this. We see that we're preparing requests to HTTP, right? Remember, there's no S here, uh, google.com. 
uh, we have some stuff, uh, some extra information here. We're using the default HTTP version. We have SSL validation. This is something that came before TLS that's a bit less secure, but we're not using it anyways because we don't have uh, HTTPS enabled. Uh, there's some stuff about cookies and cookie jars, which is making me hungry. Um, and then uh, there seems to be some information about opening and closing uh, different uh, sessions. I think I had this tab open, maybe that might be why. Um, and then there's some information about the DNS. Uh, it zapped the DNS cache, I guess, because it wanted to make sure that I have the most recent IP address, which we looked at in the previous video, for google.com. And it looks like it's going to port 80 at this IP address for Google. Um, and look at this, we have some, uh, these are the uh, the headers for the uh, requests. So we're making a get request, which we'll look at in future videos using the HTTP 1.1 protocol for slash, which is the root directory um, for google.com. So we'll see a bit more of that later when we look at the headers. Um, and then the host is Google. There's a cookie in here, whatever that is. And there's a user agent. This is just showing that I'm using Insomnia instead of something like Chrome. And there's something about accepting different types of file types, uh, in this case, anything. And you can see that we actually even get back a response. We're getting back HTTP 1. Uh, oops, 1.1 response. Um, we're getting back a status code that it moved and then some information about all that. Uh, we see in here, we see a date, we see expire, cache control, uh, server, content length, all that kind of stuff is in here, which is pretty nice. And we have some information in the body as well. Um, it looks like we're receiving chunks of data. So um, that's pretty cool. There's a lot of information packed in here. This is all happening behind the scenes just from one simple request. Um, so there's a lot of kind of infrastructure set up, protocols, things passing back and forth that was kind of invisible to us day to day. Uh, but if you dig into it, uh, it all should hopefully start to slowly make sense. And there would be terms like HTTP, like URLs, like the DNS, uh, like the different ports and the protocols that uh, should hopefully start to make sense. Um, I'm going to switch this now really quick to HTTPS and we're going to look at if there is a difference. So I'll switch this to HTTPS colon slash slash google.com and I'll click on send. Um, and that's going to uh, make a new request now, preparing request to HTTPS google.com. Uh, we can see that we have some of the same information uh, here about cookie jars and all that kind of stuff. Um, let's see what it tells us here. You can see now that we are connecting to port 443. And uh, Insomnia knows to do this because when we use HTTPS, um, that uses a different port number, um, 443 instead of 80, which is used by uh, HTTP by default. There's a whole bunch of information here, as we can see, using TLS. <clears throat> There's some information about certificates and handshakes and headers and all that kind of stuff and ciphers, uh, which is uh, what I was mentioning. This is transport layer security. This is all the stuff that's happening uh, because we're using HTTPS to verify that I am indeed talking to google.com and it's authorizing that this really is google.com that I'm talking to and not someone else. And you can see that there's some certificate information right here. You can see that this is Google's trust um, LLC that seems to be pretty legit. Um, and then in this case, you can see that we're actually making get requests using HTTP protocol version two, which is pretty nice. Um, so we seem to be upgraded here when we're using HTTPS. And now uh, most of the other stuff in here is the same. The only difference being that most of this connection is happening uh, over uh, HTTP two as well as uh, TLS now. So everything is encrypted back and forth. So if someone was listening into this connection, they wouldn't be able to actually see uh, what the data is that we're transmitting back and forth to each other. So now we can see that uh, this is also in HTTP two is a response. And then we can uh, keep going and read some more of the information in here. So that's pretty cool. I also want to show you really quickly what this might visually look like in your day to day, like browsing. For example, if I open up Chrome, um, I can't really zoom in on this little top bar here, but if you really open up most modern websites today uh, in Chrome uh, or even in other browsers like Safari or Firefox, there should be a little lock icon. And if you click on that before the URL name, you can see that it says something like connection is secure or something along those lines. And if you click on that, it'll give you some information on the certificate and that this connection is secure for that domain. Um, so that is showing us that we're using HTTPS and uh, I'm I technically authorized uh, to talk to Google in this case, and it really is Google and it's not someone else. So hopefully that makes sense. That is actually super crucial. Uh, when we're doing local host development, most of the time we're going to be using HTTP because we don't have certificates installed to verify uh, like servers and all that kind of stuff, which is an extra layer, an extra set of steps that we need to do when we actually set our um, API into production mode for other people to use. Uh, so most of the time you're going to see that we're going to be using HTTP connections, which are all in plain text, which is totally fine for local development. 
but then we're probably going to need to add an extra layer of security on top when we go into production uh, and actually add that certificate and change things over to HTTPS. And that might change a little bit of um, how we handle some of the, the code, but most of the time it's going to be pretty similar because the headers um, are going to be mostly the same. Okay. So there we have it. That's HTTP and HTTPS, which is just HTTP over TLS, as we saw a little demo of together. Um, the next thing I want to show you is TCP, which is Transmission Control Protocol. So the way that this works is this is at a layer down in this uh, OSI stack. Okay. So HTTP uh, and a lot of these uh, protocols are going to be using different transport uh, layer technologies and different network layer, data link, physical layer technologies. Um, so they can kind of choose which of these to use. What you'll see a lot of the time is uh, TCP is going to be one of the kind of go-tos um, and the most common one that you probably see out there, um, especially in the context of the work that we'll be doing. Now, um, this is a way to send uh, message packets over a network. Um, it helps us uh, keep things reliable, ordered, and does some error checking on the delivery using things like checksums, uh, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and it usually uses uh, the layer below it, IP, which is internet protocol to deliver data over these networks, which I'll show you uh, when we get to the IP section. So the way that this works is um, you can think of it like this. Um, when we saw HTTP, it was a very high level. We basically uh, created a protocol to say, I need some resource and please give it to me. What TCP deals with is one layer uh, below that, which is when I ask for that resource, uh, there's actually a few steps that I need to take um, when I'm using TCP. Uh, TCP says, okay, I'm going to ask for that resource. Let's say I'm asking for index.html. Um, the server is going to be like, here is index.html as well as all the data for it. And then the client is going to be like, okay, I've verified that this is all correct, uh, that there weren't any errors in the transit. Um, and that it's in the correct order and it's uh, everything checks out. And if that's true, I'm going to send you like an okay message. I'm going to be like, I got it. Um, all good. Thank you so much for sending me that index HTML. So there's kind of like this three step process um, that goes on with TCP. Um, there's uh, like the technical terms are like uh, synchronizing acknowledgement and like SYN and SYNAC and all that kind of stuff, which you might see thrown around. But really at its core is this is what's happening. We ask for something. The server is going to give us that thing and it's going to wait for us to respond that we got that thing uh, and acknowledge that we got that thing. Otherwise, um, it's probably going to think that we didn't get that thing and it might need to retransmit it, for example. So um, there's this a kind of verification that we really did get the stuff that we asked for and it's the correct stuff as well. You can imagine this is very important uh, for things that need that kind of uh, like a surety, right? Like, uh, for example, um, imagine you're going to uh, a bank and you want to make sure that you really did send that uh, the correct amount of money. You don't want to just like like just hope that it got there uh, and that you know maybe uh, maybe it didn't get there like but 99% of the time it got there kind of thing. That would be pretty awful. Um, uh, same things with uh, things like uh, HTML pages and uh, like even the REST API uh, content that we're going to be dealing with. We want to make sure that we send back all the JSON correctly. We don't want to be missing stuff in the JSON that would break our JSON parse and stringify functions. Uh, HTML, it would break if we don't have the correct tags in there, for example. We want to make sure that all that data and the text content is sent correctly uh, bit by bit so that there's no errors. And if there was an error, it's okay to ask for it to retransmit it. We'll wait for that. It's totally fine to wait for that. Uh, because the alternative is that just the application is just going to break, uh, which is not what we want anyways. So that's how TCP works. It's very um, reliable. And uh, the trade off is that it's much slower. Uh, but it, that's just kind of uh, how we need uh, this to work, uh, because there needs to be this extra layer of acknowledgement that that actually was what we asked for in the first place. Okay, if you think it, it, of this in like real world terms, uh, imagine that you uh, send like uh, you probably shouldn't do this, but imagine that you send uh, some money in an envelope to your friend right across the city, for example. Um, and what you will do is that send uh, that friend will send you uh, back um, that they uh, that they that they got that uh, that they got that money and the amount of money that they got. Right. You'd want to be able to uh, have that acknowledgement. So in this case, they'd say, I want like, you know, twenty dollars. And you'd say, OK, here's twenty dollars. I'm going to put it in the in the packet and I'm going to send it to you. Um, the TCP part of this is your friend is going to send back that, yes, I received $20. Maybe they'll sign it with their signature or something or put a selfie on it or whatever. So you know it really is them. 
uh, but there's this acknowledgement that they got it. Um, the alternative, which we'll look at next, which is UDP, is missing that last step, which is I'm going to just send the $20 to you and just hope that you got it. Um, and if you didn't, then kind of like too bad kind of thing, right? So uh, there's pros and cons to this, and we'll see applications of that uh, in a sec. So these are the headers. Um, now, I don't want to get too deep into this, but I want to uh, note something interesting here, uh, because when we compare this to IP address or uh, the IP protocol, sorry, we'll see that there's something missing here. TCP headers deal with specifically the ports, right? Source port, destination port. There's also things like a sequence number, an acknowledgement number, right? These are things to verify that we are getting the things that we said. There's all this fancy stuff in here. For example, the size of stuff, the checksum is the thing that's checking to see that all the bits um, are hashed correctly. Uh, and then finally, at the very end, we get the data for that packet. So uh, for example, we might get like sequence one, two, three, four, five for a very long amount of content, and then we would stitch them together on the client. Uh, and then we would verify that all the checksums match, and then we could actually present that to the application. Um, so notice that there are a few things missing. We only have port numbers here, okay? Um, IP is gonna deal with the addressing part of it. Uh, TCP just cares about the ports. So this is why we'll normally see TCP being used with IP, which we'll get to shortly, okay? So before we get to that, I wanna show you the alternative to TCP or the main alternative as well. There are many others, uh, but UDP is the biggest one, short for User Datagram Protocol. Um, this is a way, again, same thing as TCP, send the, uh, message packets over a network. However, the difference is, this is meant to be simple, fast, and real time, okay? Uh, it also uses IP, just like TCP, which I'll show you shortly. So the way that this would work is, I would say, for example, ask for like some movie file or like YouTube content or Netflix content or something like that. Now, uh, that server is going to send me like a stream of just chunks of that data all at once. It's just gonna like throw stuff back at me, right? Um, so if you think about like a movie, for example, a movie is just a bunch of bits, um, uh, like one frame at a time. And if we didn't get the frame, uh, fully, we're just going to be missing little bits of data in that frame, but most of it will look mostly okay, right? If we're missing a few bits and millions of bits, we're not going to really notice the difference visually unless you're like staying really, really close to the screen. Um, so it actually doesn't make any sense in the, in the case of something like uh, a video to retransmit stuff that we missed because we're already past that frame. We're already like in the next scene, for example, right? Like I, I don't really care that I missed the content in the previous scene if I'm already on the next scene, right? Uh, so that's where something like UDP would come in, right? We're just gonna throw data as fast as we can. And if it gets messed up a little bit here and there, it's kind of okay, right? It's not the end of the world that, you know, there's some pixelation in part of the picture or that some of the colors are slightly off uh, in some of the pixels, right? It, 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 it impacts the kind of experience a little bit, but most of the time you're not gonna notice it. And we kind of notice like things like compression artifacts all the time anyways in a lot of video. So it's a kind of, it, it's, it's a good trade-off for the fact that we can watch real-time video in the first place, right? Like if you think like a webcam, for example, um, and we're having like a, a call together, uh, it wouldn't really make sense for me to retransmit like the previous few seconds uh, because we're already, we're doing it in real time. You only want to see what you're seeing right now. You don't really care about anything that happened even a second ago. So we want to make sure that we're sending everything as fast as we can right away. And then if we miss it, we miss it. It's, it's fine. Uh, we'll see some uh, some artifacts, but then uh, but then we can just keep going on uh, to the next frame. Um, so the UDB header is very simple. It looks like this. It's basically a source port, destination port, the length and the checksum, uh, and then just the data just the chunks of data below. And we just throw these things at the uh, the client uh, and the client uh, just kind of takes them and, sh and puts them where they need to be. Um, and then if we miss this stuff, it's, it misses stuff, it's okay. Um, but it does have a checksum in there uh, just, just for some correction, error correction within the data. Uh, so at least it knows maybe something is wrong, uh, but it doesn't really have any way to really do anything about it. Okay. Now, I mentioned IP a few times, uh, and both of these protocols, uh, TCP and UDP, work usually over IP. Uh, IP is short for Internet Protocol. We looked a little bit about this uh, for IP addresses. And this is at, at the layer lower uh, than TCP and UDP in this stack. This is at the network layer. We specifically looked at IPv4 and IPv6 last time, um, but uh, this is what the, I'll show you the header in a second. Um, but this is the way to deliver the packets from the source to the destination um, when it comes to the actual addressing. 
We usually combine this with the transport layer, so they usually go together, as you'll see in a sec. So for example, you usually see stuff like TCP over IP or TCP slash IP uh, to show that kind of they're, they're, they work together to deliver packets to their destination. Um, and we're usually talking about IP addresses when we're talking about IP protocol. So let me show you the header so it makes more sense. Um, we have a bunch of random metadata at the top, so we're not too interested in that to start. And the main part I want to show you for IP is these two parts right here. Notice that IP headers have the source address and the destination address. These are the IP addresses. Okay. Notice that the TCP and the UDP uh, headers, TCP right here, uh, has the source port destination port. U UDP has a source port destination port, but they are missing the address. Recall that we need both of these things. We need both the address and the port. So if you go back to like Insomnia, for example, notice that we need both the address and the port number, right? So the port is coming from TCP and UDP and the IP address is coming from the IP header. Okay, so we, we, we these kind of work together to get uh, packets to where they need to go on a network, which is, which is pretty cool. So um, just keep that in mind that these technologies all kind of work together to get uh, data from one place to another. And these are just some examples that we'll see most commonly, but there are many other protocols, like for example, mailing protocols, file transfer protocols, and they all just deal with how to structure this information. For example, if you think of this structure, they all have their own structure that uh, applications uh, and other computers can rely on so that they can figure out how to get data from one place to the next. Um, so I hope that this content helped a lot. I know it was definitely a bit of a deep dive into like non-coding content and networking content, but really if you can um, kind of put two and two together with things like DNS, IP addresses, ports, and then all these protocols, it really, really helps because you're going to see these terminologies, uh, terms and acronyms and all that kind of stuff pop up all the time. And when you're thinking about the internet, which you're going to be working with a lot, it really, really helps to have an, a basic understanding of how things actually work and how things communicate. Because at the end of the day, all we're doing is creating another communication layer on top of all this called REST, which is what our REST API is going to be doing anyways. So that's pretty cool. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, I'd love it if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you want to contribute to the channel uh, as well in other ways, there's Patreon set up, so you can find that in the description as well as YouTube memberships uh, and super thanks. Uh, so I'd appreciate it if you could uh, check those out as well. Uh, what we're going to do in the next video together is go a bit deeper into this idea of request uh, and response headers, specifically something called HTTP headers, which were these ones that we looked at. Um, it turns out that there's actually a lot uh, to, that goes on in this uh, space uh, when we're working with APIs and working with the browser and uh, the network back and forth. And this specific part of the header is what we're going to be working with a lot. We're even going to be creating these ourselves uh, in things like JavaScript or TypeScript and Dino uh, or any other uh, thing tool like Node. You will be working with these all the time. And there's a lot of information in these that we need to make our APIs work. So I can't wait to get to that video next. I will see you in that one.